By the end of book one of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics in the final chapter, chapter 13, we know that the highest good for Aristotle will be the end or goal that is an activity that is aimed at or promotes, um, promoted by rather, or is produced by political science, which is the discipline that cares for the polis. We know that the true politician or a statesman uh, engages in aiming at this goal when they rule the polis. We know that this goal answers to the notion of happiness or eudaimonia. We know that it is to be complete. That is, it's always desired for its own sake, never for the sake of anything else. It's to be self-sufficient. That is, it lacks nothing. And it is to be most choice-worthy, meaning that it would always be chosen over any alternative. And we know that it is in accordance with the virtues of character and thought, that is, this activity, along with a sufficient amount of external goods. We know in a general way that a virtue of something is a quality or excellence that enables it to perform its characteristic activity well, as Aristotle describes to us in many places. Aristotle made clear that in the case of human beings, this virtue is to be understood as a quality of the human soul. He seems to take it for granted that it's not a quality of the body. He makes this clear in section 6 of um, chapter 13. So it's a quality of the human soul. We don't praise someone um, as a human being because of their having a good body or having a healthy body or having a beautiful body. We praise them uh, as a human being because of qualities of their soul. The virtues in general, then, are going to be qualities of the soul that enable the soul to serve the living being whose soul it is well. Qualities of the soul that enable this soul to serve the living being well. They enable it to perform well as a living being. That's the basic idea. And we know from the function argument that the human virtues are also those activities of the human soul that constitute happiness. Because of this primary role in happiness, what Aristotle calls, or what's translated here as the true politician or the statesman, is concerned, above all, with passing laws that promote human virtue. And in order to do this, the statesman must know about the human soul. So the instruction that Aristotle is giving here, it's always useful to keep in mind, is best seen as advice to the budding statesman, the politician who aspires to rule in the city, advice on what the human soul is like, scientific knowledge, really, of, of the human soul that will enable the statesman or the politician to um, promote the happiness of the city. That's the idea. Uh, in general, for the ancient Greek, the soul, or the, the suke, the psyche, as we think of it, is what this is. Um, referring to here, soul or suke, which is the source of our word for the psyche. But it doesn't refer either to what well, we tend to associate, I think, with soul, some kind of metaphysical entity that has the quality above all of being immortal and perhaps also will endure judgment in the afterlife or something like that. That's what we tend, I think, to associate with soul. If we don't associate something like a kind of depth of personality and the the musical genre that goes with um, the depth of personality. But for, for the Greeks generally, and for Aristotle also, the soul, or suke, was the principle of a living being whose presence distinguished it from a non-living being. And you can see the entry in the glossary of our text for uh, details on that. Aristotle offered an account of the psyche or soul in his work that we know as De Anima, Latin for On the Soul, 
which he refers to obliquely here. And in this work, he analyzed the different parts of the soul. So there's this living principle that is responsible for the fact that a living organism is alive. That's the general generic notion of the soul. And then Aristotle analyzed this, broke it down into the different parts of this living principle, parts that are responsible for different aspects of life. And here he reviews this analysis with an eye to his current purpose, which is, of course, to provide this advice to the aspiring politician, the, the aspiring ruler of the city. Not all parts of the soul are going to turn out to be relevant to the virtues that make a human being good qua human being. This is an idea that might be a little bit foreign to us given the Christian heritage that, that we inherited after Aristotle, which tends to associate the soul with the locus of personality and therefore make it entirely relevant to the goodness of a human being qua human being, or insofar as the human being is a human being as opposed to an animal or a living organism or something else. But for Aristotle and for the Greeks, the soul is a much broader concept, and it's only going to be a part of the, the soul that will be relevant to the question of the virtues and the good of the human being qua human being. So this division of the soul that Aristotle uh, works out here in this work and in other works, um, actually here he more or less relies on it rather than works it out, but the division of the soul will mark out for Aristotle a division of the virtues. So we get uh, something like this account. We have, um, first of all, a um, division between the non-rational and the rational parts of the soul. This is the, the basic division. We can think of non-rational here as involving primarily those automatic or mechanical functionings of the soul, um, or more that end of the spectrum, we could say, whereas the rational involves those things that are best understood not as mechanical or automatic functionings, but rather as the exercise of judgment and thought. So that's the basic, the basic division. And then there's uh, going to be a subdivision under the non-rational. So we get the uh, division between the nutritive or plant-like part of the soul and the appetitive or animal-like. Part of the soul. And then what this does is it leaves for the rational part of the soul um, a likeness to the divine. Uh, so this would be, we could describe this as the fully rational part of the soul. Um, why fully rather than just rational? I'll explain that in a second. But this is perhaps best characterized as the godlike part of the soul, since Aristotle associates it with the divine. These are qualities that the divine uh, partake, uh, divine beings uh, or spiritual beings partake of, as well as human beings who are embodied, of course. So, what we have here is uh different parts of the soul that are that are assigned different functions that are responsible to, for, for different functions aristotle in other words looks at the various life activities the activities of the living human being and categorizes or classifies the cl these uh activities into different groupings that seem to naturally go together and to be distinct from the activities in the other groupings so this is the analytical procedure that leads to this um, division of the soul. It's basically an empirical analytical procedure. 
So that's important, I think. Here. Aristotle is not engaging in some kind of religious dogmatics or anything like that to get to arrive at this. He's engaging in the, the original psychology, you could say, uh, which includes, which borders, as psychology does today, on the one hand, uh, at the one end of the spectrum on biology and physiology, and on the other end of the spectrum, things like cognitive science and AI and, and logic and computer science. And basically the same thing uh, is, is true here in Aristotle's uh, original psychology. So on the nutritive end, we have the functions of nutrition, reproduction, growth, digestion, um, aging. In other words, all of those functions that more or less go on in the human being, whether or not the human being is aware of them, many of them are almost entirely unconscious. Um, and so these are not going to be uh, under the control of reason. They're not under the rational or conscious control of, of reason at all. On the opposite end of the spectrum are those that are fully under the control of reason, the fully rational functions. Um, and these are going to involve things like understanding, deliberation, decision, wishing, um, theoretical contemplation. And these are ultimately going to be associated with uh, what Aristotle would call the virtues of thought, things like wisdom and prudence. In between are those functions that distinguish living organisms from the plants, but that human beings also um, have in a distinction from purely spiritual beings. And so it's best thought of as those functions that we share with the animals, although um, there is going to be an important distinction, as we'll see, in the way in which this manifests itself or expresses itself in human beings, the way in which the appetitive part of the soul. So we're calling this the appetitive part of the soul, which is uh, standard, but it includes more than just the appetites. So it includes the appetites, uh, hunger, thirst, sex drive, and so on, those functions, but more broadly, it also would uh, include perception, uh, self-motion, pleasure and pain, various feelings, fear, anger, desires, as well as the appetites. So those functions that we share with animals as well, which are often tend to be conscious, but um, are not fully under the control of reason. Instead, the appetites in human beings are going to have a peculiar relationship to reason, according to Aristotle, different from the animals. So if you have just a purely, uh, let's see if I can do this, if you have just a purely um, plant-like or plant-like organism, uh, it's only going to have these nutritive functions. It's not going to have appetites or reason. If you have uh, a mere animal, uh, it will have nutritive and also the appetitive functions that I just mentioned, including perception, self-motion, pleasure and pain, feelings, fear, anger, desires, and appetites. But it, it will not have reason. And that is going to determine the limits, so to speak, of the appetitive part of the soul. The appetitive part of the soul is going to be, in a non-human animal, um, in Aristotle's understanding, just self-contained. It's not going to... Um, have any relationship to the divine or the godlike. This is different in human beings. In human beings, because there is the presence of this fully rational part of the soul alongside, as it were, the appetitive and the, and the nutritive, um, there's the possibility of the appetitive part to have uh, a responsive relationship to the fully rational part. And this is going to be important for Aristotle's account of the virtues. So to summarize this again, the nutritive part of the soul is the part of a human being only insofar as the human being is a living being, but there's nothing distinctively human about it. It's not the concern of the statesman or the true politician per se, but the concern of the farmer, the doctor, the physical trainer, and related professions. 
The statesman's only role is to see to it that these disciplines are able to flourish in the city so that the basic nutritive needs of the human being is um, are able to be met. It's uncontroversial that the virtues of the nutritive part of the soul, while they're fully desirable and necessary for happiness, are not sufficient. So it's true that a person prone to digestive problems will um, be hindered from attaining full happiness, but having a well-functioning digestive system is not enough to make a person happy, to have their, make their life happy. Moreover, being in good bodily condition doesn't make a person good qua human being. So this part of the soul is, is not going to be particularly relevant to the understanding of the human being um, for the two reasons that the well-functioning of this, the, the domain of, of the nutritive part of the soul is necessary but not sufficient for happiness. And also, it doesn't particularly have to do with what's good about a human being qua human being. We don't say, you know, in someone's obituary, um, you know, throughout their whole life, they had uh, really good digestion and regular bowel movements. That's not right. That's not part of what people praise uh, someone's life for. On the other end of the spectrum, the fully rational part of the soul is an aspect of it, as I said, that makes humans akin to purely spiritual beings, such as gods and daimons. The capacity of this part of the soul doesn't seem to require a body at all, living or otherwise. You, some of you might recall uh, Descartes' meditations where he was led to doubt the ex very existence of his body, but he couldn't ex doubt the existence of himself, of his own self. So there's this part of the soul that doesn't seem to require a body. Logical argumentation, theoretical contemplation, mathematical computation, understanding cause and effect, these are the things that seem to belong to pure mind and therefore the absolute opposite end of the spectrum from the um, domain of the nutritive part of the soul, which is concerned entirely with the automatic functionings of the body. But because these purely rational or fully rational godlike functions are disembodied, they can seem disconnected to action and thus cut off from the distinctive good of being a human being. These are ways in which we're like computers, in many ways, we might say today. And this raises a question about whether the virtues of this part of the soul are going to be virtues of the human being, qua human being, at all. Because the virtue of being, let's say, um, logically perfect or a fast computer doesn't seem to be a capacity that makes one a better human being. However, for Aristotle, included in this part are things like wisdom and prudence, which do seem to be more distinctively ethical virtues, as you might say. And further, th these are the virtues that enable us to taste something of the life of the gods. And so, because of the connection that I've remarked upon before about the between the, the happy life, the life of eudaimonia, and the blessed life, Aristotle naturally assumes that the happy life should partake of them. So there are going to be virtues associated with this part of the soul, namely the virtues of thought. The virtues of thought are over here. Okay. The appetitive part is the part of the soul that's most strongly connected with the virtues that are obviously distinctively human. This part is shared with the animals, and yet it takes a distinctive form in the human. So Aristotle describes this uh, beginning section 15, where he says, another nature in the soul would seem to be non-rational, another besides the nutritive part of the soul, in a, though in a way it shares in reason. For in the continent and the incontinent person, we praise their reason and the part of the soul that has reason because it exhorts them correctly and towards whatever is best. But they evidently also have and then some other part that is by nature something apart from reason, clashing and struggling with reason. In a later video, we'll talk about this idea of continence, which of course we associate 
um, you know, with being able to retain your your the contents of your bowels, but it has a broader sense here with um, Aristotle in this translation. But what he's describing here is the way in which someone who struggles with self-control, you know, consider a recovering addict as a prime example. Um, that is, we say that they seem to be divided in themselves. Their their appetites are divided with the ration, against the rational part of their soul, and these two parts are in, in struggle with one another. That's what he's referring to here. Continuing, for just as the un, just as uncontrolled parts of the body, when we decide to move them to the right, do the contrary and move off to the left, the same is true of the soul. For incontinent people have impulses in contrary directions. In bodies, admittedly, we see the part go astray, whereas we do not see it in the soul. Nevertheless, presumably, we should suppose that the soul also has something apart from reason, countering and opposing reason. The precise way it is different does not matter. However, this part as well as the rational part appears, as we said, to share in reason. At any rate, in the continent person, it obeys reason. And in the temperate and brave person, it presumably listens still better to reason, since there it agrees with reason and everything. In part, what he's doing here is, is giving an argument for analogizing the parts of the soul to the parts of the body. That is, just as, you know, let's say the one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing, as we say. Your, your two hands can be working at cross purposes. Your body can be divided against itself, which is a sign that it has different parts. So, too, the fact that the soul can be divided against itself. When the appetites are at war with reason, that suggests that there are different parts of the soul. Even, of course, we don't see these parts like we see the parts of the body, but we can infer that they exist. But here, in the appetitive parts of the soul, there is the possibility not only of them being at war with each other, but in this last sentence, what he points to is the way in which um, the, the appetites can obey reason. And this leads to the second major division of the virtues for Aristotle, namely the virtues of character. What he calls the virtues of character refer to um, those excellences, those good qualities that the appetite, of, the various parts of the appetitive part of the soul, the appetites, broadly construed, can possess. Um, when they are responsive to reason. So this is what we're going to fully work out in this and uh, in succeeding videos, but this is the basic division then of the virtue between the virtues of character and the virtues of thought. Uh, this is worked out in relationship to the different parts of the soul. The principle for the division between these two classes of virtues is the division between the rational, the fully rational part of the soul, and the appetitive part of the soul. So the key idea here is that even though we share with animals an appetitive part of the soul, as well as a nutritive part, we have an appetitive part of the soul that responds to reason. Our very appetites, our capacity for pleasure and pain, fears and emotions, and everything that belongs to the appetitive part has the capacity to respond to our rational part of the soul. And Aristotle has a, a very vivid metaphor that he uses to describe the way in which the appetitive part is responsible to the um, rational part. He analogizes the, the appetitive part to uh, a child and the rational part to a father. And in section 19, he refers to a capacity to respond on behalf of the appetitive part to the rational part by listening to reason as to a father. By listening to reason as to a father. And this is unlike the nutritive part that doesn't respond to reason at all. The nutritive part doesn't respond to reason at all. It's In that respect, it's like, you know, um, a plant that doesn't respond to your talking to it at all or a wild animal that, that isn't going to respond to your commands. But it's different with the appetitive part. The appetitive part is like a small child that has a natural tendency, an intrinsic or inherent natural tendency to respond to the um, rational part of the soul, just as a small child has a natural tendency to respond to its father's commands. This is the origin of the virtues of character, virtues of 
such as temperance, bravery, and generosity. So, once again, to sum up for Aristotle, the distinctively human virtues include two main divisions, which correspond to the two parts of the soul, two of the three parts of the soul. There are the virtues of the appetitive part of the soul, which are the virtues of character, as well as the virtues of the fully rational part of the soul, which are the virtues of thought. So first up for investigation are the virtues of character. Later on, Aristotle will examine the virtues of thought. So for now, within this context, um, when I refer to virtue alone, let that designate only virtue of character. Sometimes I'll use the abbreviated version, but I'm, I'm talking about virtues of character only. So there are several questions with regard to the virtues of character. And here are some of the questions. What is the definition of a virtue of character? In particular, what is meant by character? What is the definition of a virtue of character? What is meant by character? How many virtues of character are there? How many virtues of character are there? If there are many different virtues of character, are they all united by a common root? Or are they all separate? What is the principle for selecting the virtues or designating a human quality as a virtue? How are the virtues acquired and maintained? What is the relationship between having or exercising a virtue and reasoning? What's the relationship between having and exercising a virtue and performing actions? What's the relationship between having and exercising a virtue and desiring and feeling? And then finally, how is a virtue acquired? So there are all these questions, beginning with the question of the definition of a virtue of character and the meaning of this idea of character, running through the question of how we're going to catalog the virtues and what they have in common if there are more than one the principle for selection, the acquisition and maintenance of um, the virtues, and the relationship with things like virtue, reasoning, performing, desiring, and feeling. So the first uh, six chapters of Book 2 build up a general philosophical definition of virtue of character. Aristotle proceeds in a perhaps unexpected way. He starts by examining how the virtues are acquired. Now, one might think that you would, at a minimum, need a definition of the virtues before you ask how they are acquired, and only then ask how you are acquired. And those of you with some familiarity with Plato's dialogues, especially the ones that are considered so-called Socratic dialogues, there's often an emphasis on defining various virtues or virtue in general. But Aristotle doesn't proceed that way. He proceeds as it were, um, by starting with the last step first, uh, at least in terms of my list of what seemed to be a logical progression of questions, rather than starting with the first question, which is what is virtue, uh, he starts with one of the last questions, how is it acquired? And this is because for Aristotle, seeing how a virtue is acquired is a clue to their nature. Seeing how a virtue is acquired is a clue to the very nature of virtue, and in particular to an understanding of this notion of character. We can start by assuming in a rough way that we have a rough idea of what a virtue of character is, since we've said that it involves the appetites responding to reason, and in order to explain what that was, we gave some sort of commonsensical examples in the way in which um, you know, for a temperate person, um, the appetites respond in the sense that, that they don't lead to immoderate eating and drinking. Um, we might imagine uh, the, the appetitive part of the soul in the case of bravery res uh, responding to reason in that uh, one is able to keep, you know, fear at a level where it doesn't become overwhelming um, and so forth. So we have a kind of rough idea of uh, what we mean by this. And so using just this rough idea at this point, without a definition, 
of what a virtue of character is. We can begin by uh, asking how such virtues are acquired. And also for Aristotle, there is a clue in the way in which these virtues are described when they are described as ethical virtues. So Aristotle is um, taking note in the very beginning of book two of the uh, etymological connection between the notion of the ethical and the notion of habit. So he says in the second, um, or actually in the last sentence here of the first paragraph of book two, virtue of character, i.e. of ethos, results from habit, ethos. Um, it's ethos, ethos. Hence its name ethical, slightly varied from ethos. So you're thrown because we have the English word ethos, right? So the, um, and I'm not certain what the correct Greek pronunciation is of these two, but the original meaning of the Greek uh, ethos from which we get our words ethics and ethical is habit. So for Aristotle, um, there appears to be a connection between the ethical virtues, which he will identify with the virtues of character, and the process of habituation. Habituation. Also, he observes, this is in section five, um, in the same chapter, ch chapter one of book two, he observes that it's often the distinctive concern of the politician or the statesman to the rulers to institute correct habituation in and through the institution, maintenance, and promotion of good customs in the city. We see this still today in, in the case of um, recycling laws and you know laws prohibiting the use of certain items that are regarded as a nuisance like um, disposable plastic bags, plastic straws, and this sort of thing. So th this is aiming at instituting good habits through the institution of good customs in the city. And this naturally raises the question, is there a connection between ethical virtue and habituation? And in fact, for Aristotle, it appears to be simply a fact of common experience and grammar that the virtues of character are acquired through habituation. The virtues of character are acquired through habituation. This is embodied in language as well as in practice. Uh, we refer to ethical or habitual virtues for Aristotle. And we also, um, just by observing how people behave, we observe that the virtues are acquired through habituation. People don't learn the virtues of character by instruction in the way in which they might learn geometry, but they acquire them through habituation. And this has an important implication for Aristotle. It implies that the virtues are, as he says, neither by nature nor against nature. Neither by nature nor against nature. And this points to a couple of different alternative accounts of the acquisition of the virtues. So the account that would say virtues are acquired by nature is what we might describe as the aristocratic view of ethical virtue. Whereas the view that says virtues are acquired against nature refers to what we may describe as the, I'll call this the drill sergeant view of ethical virtue. So what are these? 
The aristocratic view would say that virtues develop naturally in certain people, much in the same way as a plant grows. That virtue is hereditary, that there are some families that are naturally endowed, say, with a talent for bravery or for moderation or for magnanimity or generosity, just as there are families that are endowed with musical talent or a talent for a particular type of athletic skill or money-making. Um, so this, I mean, the word aristocracy means rule by the best, and there's still residues of this even in, let's say, the modern British aristocracy. Um, we're familiar with the phrase, you know, especially if you watch any masterpiece theater or shows like this that are um, British historical period drama, um, the idea that one should... Um, respect one's betters, betters, one's betters, that there's a, there's a kind of association of um, family cultivation and breeding with certain virtues. And the breeding here is just, the, you know, breeding in the sense of horse breeding or dog breeding. It's, it's a matter of just natural cultivation. These things are inherited and this is one virtue that Aristotle uh, has to compete with in his particular context, less so in our more egalitarian age. But still, this would, this would still be a virtue. This would still be a generic view that we, we didn't necessarily associate with particular classes of society, but we just thought that, you know, maybe there are just some people who are just naturally nice people, let's say. That might be some version of this aristocratic view that we we'll probably hesitate to call it an aristocratic view because of the associations, but it would include the idea that there are some people who are just, you know, bad seeds. They're just naturally mean and vicious, and there are other people who just seem to be naturally much more sympathetic, for example. So that's what this first view is referring to. Um, and the second view that Aristotle is resisting is the drill sergeant view, that virtues are imposed by strict, often violent discipline against natural re re um, resistance. You know, so if a certain individual regards, let's say, being a United States Marine as a virtue, they think you're not um, going to be uh, in possession of that virtue until you're broken down. We've got to break you down and remake you as a Marine, right? The human nature must be broken before virtue can be imposed by force. This is sort of, this goes along with the, the spare the rod, spoil the child view of moral instruction. And this view also Aristotle rejects. He rejects both of these views. And actually he thinks that just the empirical observation of the role that habituation plays in the formation of virtue in human beings really tends to cut against both of these views as being plausible views. We see a disanalogy between cases in which um, something either happens naturally or it happens only against the resistance of nature. Against the first view, against the aristocratic view, Aristotle argues that if virtue arose by nature, then habituation would be unnecessary and, and superfluous. As he says here in chapter one, you don't habituate a stone to roll downhill. It's not necessary. If something happens by nature, habituation is unnecessary and superfluous. Furthermore, he says, virtues are not natural potentials or natural capacities because a natural potential or natural capacity precedes the activities. So what are examples of natural potentials or natural capacities? Well, so the five senses, for example, are examples of potentials or capacities that precede the activities. The activities that my eyes perform, for example, um, exist and precede, um, rather the capacity to see exists and precede the actions that my eyes perform. When I'm asleep, I go to bed, I sleep, I still have the capacity to see um, throughout the night, God willing. I wake up in the morning and then I'm able to exercise this potential or capacity. But this isn't the case with virtues. Virtues don't precede the activities. And we'll, we'll return to that point uh, in just one second. Virtues don't precede the activities. Virtues uh, succeed the activities rather than precede the activities. 
against the second one, the drill sergeant view, Aristotle argues that if the virtues were against our nature, if the human virtues, I'm not speaking here about being a Marine per se, I was just using that as an analogy, but the virtues of human nature that Aristotle has in mind, things like bravery, temperance, um, generosity, and so forth, that these things, um, if they were against our nature, no amount of habituation would have any effect on. So you can't habituate a stone to roll uphill either because this goes against the nature of a stone. If something is truly against the nature of a thing, then you can never habituate that thing to be this something. And so if the virtues were really against human nature, you could never habituate human beings to have these virtues. And you can see what the rest of the argument implicitly is here, that if, since we do um, observe people acquiring virtues through habituation, then um, they're not against our nature. So the structure of the argument here, um, I think is worth repeating that the point he's, he's making is that uh, he's denying that, that virtues are either by nature or against nature that virtues are either something that happens naturally in human beings or that there's something that happens against our nature. And that means they have this kind of peculiar status within the soul. They're neither um, against nature nor by nature. Uh, we are, he says, this is in section three, by nature able to acquire them. And we are completed through habit. We are completed through habit. So we, we do have a nature that's such that it's able to require them, a kind of susceptibility or malleability of our appetites to the process by which virtue is acquired. But this is not a capacity in the sense that, you know, the five senses are capacities that just, unless barring some, um, you know, um, organic damage to the organism are just going to, issue in their activities as a matter of course. This susceptibility is something that needs to be worked on through the process of habituation in order to be realized. In that respect, you, you might think of something like the susceptibility of clay to become a pot. Clay, clay doesn't naturally become a pot, but it has a susceptibility to become a pot if it's worked on in a certain way. And that's the way in which um, the virtues are natural to us. Not natural in the sense that they will occur as a, just as a mere result of the processes of nature, but in the sense that they are amenable in a certain way to um, being uh, acquired through a process that nonetheless must be must involve some kind of conscious decision on the part of someone to um, instill in the material. And this process is effectively practice, performing the activities proper to virtue. We acquire a virtue by practice. Practice makes perfect, practice makes ethically perfect, practice makes morally perfect. Practice, performing the activities proper to a virtue leads to the acquisition of the virtue, just as we acquire a technical skill or a handicraft or the capacity to play a musical instrument. Uh, which are some of the examples that Aristotle cites here. So um, he says there, this is the second half of section four. Virtues, by contrast, we acquire just as we acquire crafts by having first performed the actions. For we learn a craft by producing the same product that we must produce when we have learned it. We become builders, for instance, by building, and we become harpists by playing the harp. So it's by building um, a bunch of defective, imperfect handicraft, uh, one kind or another, that we come to acquire the expertise in building that handicraft. It's by playing, at first, horrible sounding harp music that eventually, through practice, we come to perfect the skill of playing the harp. And the virtues are the same way. Similarly, 
He says, we become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate actions, and brave by doing brave actions. Habitual repetition of similar activities results in a character. And the ancient Greek words for habit and character are cognates here. So a character here is, I mean, just think a habit. A habit and a character are virtually the same thing, except that oftentimes I think in our English usage, we think of the habit as something more like the action, the, the practice, whereas the character is understood as something being more in, internal. And indeed, as we'll see for Aristotle, character is, is a state, a kind of settled or stable habit of the soul. That's the, the character. So actions lead to these habits. Thus, we have habituation practice in performing the actions characteristic of a certain type of virtue. For example, just actions or temperate actions or generous actions brings about this state of the soul called character, a kind of habit of the soul, an internal habit um, that is going to be directly associated with the possession of a virtue in a way we'll see in a couple minutes. Habits can also bring ruin upon a human being if they're bad habits. Just as practicing a skill incorrectly ruins one's ability to perform that skill, um, people are probably aware of examples of this in sports, for example, like practicing shooting a jump shot or free throw in basketball the wrong way, um, ruins your ability to perform that skill or creates tremendous obstacles that later may or may not be able to be overcome um, to doing the action in the right way. In a similar way, bad moral habits can ruin our character. So incorrect habituation is not morally neutral. It's actually harmful. And this points to the need of having a good teacher if one is to acquire the virtues. Just like it's important to have a good coach early on if one is to learn how to shoot a jump shot or um, a free throw correctly. You need to have a good teacher if you're to acquire the virtues because the teacher is going to provide you with someone to imitate. Persons learn to be virtuous by imitating the actions of a virtuous person. Just as in sports, typically, it's not, it's not that you're taught to, teach, to shoot a free throw properly by just being verbally instructed on how to place your hands and so on. Almost, I'm quite certain, 100% of the time, the coach is going to actually show you, demonstrate how to shoot a free throw, and then the, um, the student is going to imitate that action. And it's the same with the virtues. It's by imitating the actions of a virtuous person that one learns to be virtuous. So this leads to our first discussion question. Is the imitation of virtuous action truly the proper way to acquire virtue? Is Aristotle correct in denying the existence of naturally virtuous people? That is, in his rejection of the aristocratic views. Is he correct to repudiate the position that the virtues are unnatural impositions on the human psyche, as a sophist might argue? Explain your answers to these questions. So that's the first discussion question. Is the imitation of virtuous action truly the proper way to acquire virtue? Is Aristotle correct to deny the existence of naturally virtuous people? Is he correct to repudiate the position that the virtues are unnatural impositions on the human psyche, as a sophist might argue? Explain your answers. The next question is, what sorts of activities are the correct ones? Aristotle gives a first approximate answer to this in uh, chapter 2 in section 6 and 7. However, the ultimate criterion of whether an activity is correct or not is correct reason. Correct reason. And we're reminded here, of course, that what we're talking about in this whole domain is the responsiveness of the appetitive part of the soul to reason. So the ultimate criterion of whether an activity is correct or not is going to be correct reason. And in particular, um, whether the activity accords with 
prudence and the mean. Prudence and the mean. These can be described as sort of two ways of looking at the standard of correct action, correctness in action, ethical correctness. Prudence is the uh, capacity of the soul that determines what the mean is. And it's the mean that ultimately is the um, objective standard of correctness. So this is sort of the, you might describe this as the, as the subjective capacity that determines what the objective standard of correctness is. But both of these together can be described as correct reason or, or sometimes it's translated as right reason. Right reason. Now, more on that in um, a couple minutes, but first of all, the, a mark of having acquired virtue for Aristotle is enjoying the actions that result from exercising the virtue. If you look at the first uh, two sections of chapter three here, he says, but we must take the pleasure or pain that supervenes on his actions to be a sign of the state of character. For if someone who abstains from bodily pleasures enjoys this abstinence itself, he is temperate. But if he is grieved by it, he is intemperate. Again, if he stands firm against terrifying situations and enjoys it, or at least does not find it painful, he is brave. But if he finds it painful, he is cowardly. For virtue of character is about pleasures and pains. For pleasure causes us to do base actions and pain causes us to abstain from fine ones. That is why we need to have had the appropriate upbringing, right from youth, as Plato says, to make us find enjoyment or pain in the right things, for this is the correct education. The correct education teaches us to find enjoyment or pain in the right things. Further, virtues are about actions and feelings, but every feeling and every action implies pleasure or pain. Hence, for this reason, too, virtue is about pleasures and pains. Okay. What one takes pleasures and pains in are determinants of one's character, because character is about pleasures and pains. What does he mean by this? It seems the view is that the true sign that a character is in place is the ease with which one performs actions in accord with that character. And this is indicated by pleasures and pains. Because pleasures and pains are the causes of action, the more pleasant it is, the easier an action is to do, and the more likely it is to be done, and, and conversely. And in fact, if in a, I mean, there's of course a threshold that you know, people who study, let's say, victims of torture and so on, are well aware of. There's a threshold beyond which one just simply cannot do an action if it's too painful. And so pleasure and pain are essential to actions, possessing, therefore, a virtue of character, which means the ability that allows us to habitually and regularly perform virtuous actions is necessarily going to involve taking pleasure in those actions. Hence, one can view the goal of habituation as, as making it easier to perform good actions. The more you practice such actions, the easier they get to do, and the more pleasurable they become, and then the easier um, they become, they are to do going forward. So there's both a kind of uh, practical aspect of this here, that uh, part of what it is to acquire a character is to... Um, take pleasure in certain actions because that's what enables you to do those actions since pleasure is the cause of action. But also we can view um, pleasure, what you take pleasure and pain in from a kind of epistemic perspective as providing us with evidence or knowledge of who it is that actually has a good character. Who has a good character? Well, it's those people who actually take pleasure in the virtuous actions. Not merely the people, let's say, who can overcome their aversion and the pain of, of performing a virtuous action in order, in order to perform the action. And that points to another important aspect of Aristotle's theory of virtues of character. For an action to be virtuous, it's not enough that it be performed. So um, in section three here of chapter three, 
He said, uh, Virtues are about actions and feelings, but every feeling, every action implies pleasure or pain. And for this reason, too, virtue is about pleasures and pains. I'm going to continue reading on here in section five. Further, as we said earlier, every state of soul is naturally related to and about whatever naturally makes it better or worse. And pleasures and pains make people base from pursuing and avoiding the wrong ones at the wrong time in the wrong ways, or whatever other distinctions of the sort are needed in an account. These bad effects of pleasure and pain are the reason why people naturally define the virtues as ways of being unaffected and undisturbed by pleasures and pains. They are wrong, however, because they speak of being unaffected without qualification, not of being unaffected in the right or wrong way at the right time and the added qualifications. We assume then that virtue is the sort of state that does the best actions concerning pleasures and pains, and the vice is the contrary. The following will also make it evident that virtue and vice are about the same things, for there are three objects of choice, fine, expedient, and pleasant, and three objects of avoidance, and their contrary, shameful, harmful, and painful. About all of these, about all of these, then the good person is correct and the bad person is an error and especially about pleasure. Um, okay. Aristotle is saying that virtuous actions require more than having the outward character of actions in order to be virtuous. Three further inner conditions must be met, and, and these are described in the bottom part of section three of chapter four, he says, um, I'll begin in the second half of the paragraph here, but for actions in accord with the virtues to be done temperately or justly, it does not suffice that they themselves have the right qualities. Rather, the agent must also be in the right state when he does them. First, he must know that he is doing them. Secondly, he must decide on them and decide on them for themselves. And thirdly, he must also do them from a firm and unchanging state. So there are going to be three inner conditions for actions to be virtuous. For actions to be virtuous. Three inner conditions must be met. The person must know they are doing a virtuous action. Second, the person must decide to do it, but not merely decide to do it, but decide to do it for its own sake. And third, the person must do it from a firm and unchanging state. In other words, this isn't a one-off, an act, as we say, out of character. Um, it's not a virtuous action if, it, if it's an action that is out of character for this person. That's the claim. So these are the these are three important conditions that Aristotle adds to a virtuous action above and beyond merely its its outward resemblance to virtuous actions or actions performed by virtuous people. It's not just the outward features, but also these three inner conditions that must be met. The person must know that he or she is doing a virtuous action. The person must decide on it for its own sake and must do it from a firm and unchanging state. And number two here, I just want to emphasize that both of these parts, that it's actually made by through a decision. We'll talk more about decision in the next video. And for its own sake, not for some ulterior motive. Those are the three inner conditions, as you much describe, might describe them, of virtuous action.
So that's the difference between a truly virtuous action and a merely, we might say, outwardly virtuous action or an imitation virtue action. We can use this concept of a, an action that's an imitation virtue. In section four, page, this is uh, page 26 in our text, uh, again, still in uh, chapter four, he says, hence actions are called just or temperate when they are temperate, when they are the sort a just or temperate person would do. But the just and temperate person is not the one who merely does these actions, but the one who also does them in the way in which, which just or temperate people do them. In what way? In this way. So we acquire virtues, though, by performing imitation virtue actions, actions that aren't really virtuous, but that are outwardly virtuous and are done in imitation of people who are truly virtuous, who are doing the actions in the right way. And what happens is that as the young person typically does these imitation virtue actions more and more, more and more regularly, they develop a habit. And then these imitation virtue actions will gradually transform into truly virtuous actions. Needless to say, this is a transformation that takes place on a spectrum with an inexact tipping point. So this is the second discussion question. Do you agree with Aristotle's list of three conditions that must be satisfied in order for an action to be authentically virtuous? That is, these conditions. Do you agree with Aristotle's list of three conditions that must be satisfied in order for an action to be authentically virtuous? Are there worthy or admirable actions that fail to satisfy these conditions? Do imitation virtue actions have any value besides being a means to acquiring virtue and good behavior? And once again, explain your answers. So that's the second discussion question. Do you agree with Aristotle's list of three conditions that must be satisfied in order for an action to be authentically virtuous? Are there worthy or admirable actions that fail to satisfy these conditions? Do imitation virtue actions have any value besides being a means to acquiring virtue and good behavior? Explain your actions. So in uh, book two, chapters five through six, Aristotle finally turns to the definition of virtue of character. Virtue is defined in the standard Aristotelian fashion by giving its genus and its specific difference. The genus is the general class to which a thing belongs. And its specific difference or species is the subclass of the genus, which distinguishes the thing from things in other subclasses of its genus. To which genus then does the virtue of character belong? We've already determined that virtue is something in the soul. So the natural procedure would be to narrow down the possible candidate contents of the soul, and if possible, eliminate the impossible or unlikely candidates until we can isolate what the genus, um, what genus rather of thing that virtue belongs to. And th this is precisely what Aristotle does, the process of elimination. First, we know that we're dealing with the appetitive part of the soul. For that reason, we can rule out things like thoughts, conscious rational processes, and unconscious organic processes like respiration and digestion. At the level of genus, the literal generic level, Aristotle sees only three possible candidates, namely feelings, capacities, and states. Feelings accompanies um, or encompasses, rather, appetites, emotions, pleasure and pain altogether. It seems to be the sort of the catch-all term, um, like appetites was used earlier. Capacities refers to the capacity to have feelings, understood in the way just described. And states would seem to refer to what we have when we have certain feelings. The state of the soul that is ours, the, the Greek word here, uh, hexis means literally possession. And once again, I refer you to the glossary for further details about that, if you're interested. So the state, though, here for our purposes, is, is it's this sort of the possession of the soul or what we have when we have certain feelings um, as described earlier. So from these three possibilities, Aristotle proceeds by a process of elimination. 
and he argues that virtues can't be a species of the genus feeling because, first of all, we are not called excellent or bad or praised or blamed because of our feelings, but we are for our virtues. Moreover, decision is somehow involved in the exercise of the virtues, but we do not decide how we feel. By the same reasoning, it's even less the case that a capacity to feel or have an appetite is the source of praise or blame or subject to decision. Thus, the only possibility is that virtue is some sort of state or possession of the soul. But what sort of possession? What he seems to mean is that it's a property of the soul in the way in which one may possess property. It can be, in principle, expropriated from the soul, but it's relatively stable in the soul. It's a possession like your house rather than like a seat on a city bus. Also, as with your property, perhaps, or your family, you're identified with it and by it. It's, it's what you have in the sense of what you have to work with, which may be something good or bad, rich or poor. Aristotle immediately identifies the good state with what is intermediate. Which brings us to the next part of the definition and a central part of Aristotle's theory of the virtues, namely the mean. The term intermediate here refers to the state that avoids excess or deficiency. And he explains this, um, chapter 6. This is right at the bottom of page 27, section 5, and continuing. He says, by the intermediate in the object, I mean what is equidistant from each extremity. This is one and the same for all. But relative to us, the intermediate is what is neither superfluous nor deficient. This is not one and is not the same for all. Uh, for instance, if, for instance, 10 are many and 2 are few, we take 6 as intermediate in the amount, Hence, it exceeds 2 and is exceeded by 10 by an equal amount. This is what is intermediate by numerical proportion. But he's going to contrast this ethical sense of intermediate from this idea of what's intermediate in a numerical sense. He, because he goes on to say, But that is not how we must take the intermediate that is relative to us. For if 10 pounds of food, for instance, are a lot for someone to eat, and 2 pounds a little... It does not follow that the trainer will pre prescribe six, since this might also be either a little or a lot for a person who is to take it, for Milo the athlete a little, but for the beginner in gymnastics a lot. And the same is true for running and wrestling. In this way, every scientific expert avoids excess and deficiency and chooses what is intermediate, but intermediate relative to us, not in the object. Hence, we must not understand intermediate to refer to some average or moderate condition, but to what avoids the extremes of excess on the one side and deficiency on the other. What counts as excess or deficiency is relative to the individual, or as we'll see, um, the situation we're talking about. We can say that it's relative to the context. The notion of an intermediate applies to virtues as states of soul because the relation of these states to the feelings and actions which, through habituation, put them there in the soul. In other words, feelings and actions admit of an intermediate condition. If they repeatedly hit this intermediate condition, they instill corresponding intermediate states in the soul. So he says, uh, beginning section 10, by virtue, I mean virtue of character, for this is about feelings and actions, and these admit of excess deficiency and an intermediate condition. We can be afraid, for instance, or be confident, or have appetites, or get angry, or feel pity, and in general have pleasure or pain, both too much and too little, and in both ways not well. But having these things at the right times about the right things, towards the right people, for the right end and in the right way is the intermediate and best condition. And this is proper to virtue. Similarly, actions also admit of excess deficiency and intermediate condition. Now, virtue is about feelings and actions in which 
excess is in error and deficiency, in which excess is in error and deficiency is blamed, whereas the intermediate condition is praised and is correct, which are both proper to virtue. So Aristotle go, goes on to define virtue in terms of a state that has an intermediate condition. And that this is the specific difference then, the state that is an intermediate condition condition. Virtue is an intermediate state of the soul that's directed on a, at a target between the extremes of excess and deficiency. And the complete definition is given as follows uh, in section 15, page 29 now, where he says, virtue then is a state that decides, consisting in a mean, the mean relative to us, which is defined by reference to reason, that is to say, to the reason by reference to which the prudent person would define it. It is a mean between two vices, one of excess and one of deficiency. This definition says that virtue is relative to us. In what sense of relative? It might sound like Aristotle is agreeing with the sophist that virtue is relative, but this isn't what he means. Relative to us means by reference to the reason of the prudent person. By reference to the reason of the prudent person. So as I said earlier before, the standard of correct reason is prudence and the mean. Relative to us is determined by reference to the reason of the prudent person. In other words, this is an application of the doctrine of chapter 2 of book 1, that the educated person should be the authority when it comes to judging things like virtue. We judge the mean by reference, sorry, that's uh, book three of chapter one. I misspoke there. Um, but we judge the mean by reference to the way in which the prudent person judges the mean. Thus, the mean cannot be construed as some kind of quantitatively determined average or median. It's a qualitative judgment. Judging the mean aims at achieving the appropriate degree of the particulars of an action. So what are these particulars? Aristotle describes these in slightly different ways and in several different passages. And because we're running out of time, I'll just refer you back to the one passage that where he alludes to this that I already read, which is section 11 of chapter 6 where he refers to having these feelings at the right times about the right things toward the right people for the right end in the right way. Uh, in book three, chapter one, he uses this term, the, the particulars of an action. The particulars of an action. So what the prudent person determines the intermediate about is going to concern the particulars of an action. And this includes things such as duration, timeliness, objects, instruments, manner, and potentially other things, the different lists have sort of different things, but I just want to give you the general idea here right now, um, because we're going to talk about prudence again later on, but duration, how long the action needs to last in order to be a, the, the virtuous action. Timeliness, at what time the action needs to be initiated, it's proper timing. Objects, to whom or what it needs to be directed or how many different objects. Instruments, whether the instruments are appropriate or not. Manner, whether the action is performed strenuously or vigorously or gently, fast or slow, etc. So excess and deficiency are two possible ways to miss the mark with regard to each of these particulars. Doing an action not long enough or too long. Doing an action too early or too late doing an action to too few or too many objects or with an instrument that's too blunt or, or too 
um, delicate, doing an action again too fast or too slowly, and so forth. That's the basic general idea. We could fill this in with an examples. And perhaps we'll be able to discuss this. So in chapter 7, Aristotle uh, brings out his first comprehensive list of the 11 virtues. And each of these can be categorized in terms of a particular domain that um, the appetitive part of the soul is going to be concerned with. And a mean of that part of the soul, which is set between a vice of excess and a vice of deficiency. So there are 11 of these, and I'm, I'm not going to write them all out because I think they're, they're pretty uh, clear, clearly displayed in uh, Section 7. Um, but I will list them uh, orally, so you can uh, take them down if you want to. So we have, and, but quickly, because we don't have uh, very much time. So in the domain of fear and confidence, there's the virtuous mean of bravery, the vice of excess, which would be either um, too little fear or too much confidence, and the vice of deficiency, which conversely would be either um, too much fear or too much confidence or too little fear, too little confidence or too much fear, rather, uh, which is cowardice. So you have in the domain of fear and confidence, you have the virtuous mean is bravery, the vice of excess is rashness, the vice of deficiency is cowardice. In the domain of pleasure, you have the virtue of temperance and its two extremes of intemperance and insensibility. In the area of money, small amounts of money, you have the virtue of generosity, the excess, which is wastefulness, and the deficiency, which is ungenerosity. In the domain of large amounts of money, you have the virtue of magnificence, the excess of ostentation and the deficiency of stinginess. In the area of large-scale honors, you have magnanimity as the virtue, vanity as the excess, and pusillanimity nimity as the deficiency. That's a tough one to say. In the area of small-scale honors, he says the virtue has no name, but there could be an excess of love of honor and a deficiency of indifference to honors. In the area of anger, you have mildness as the virtue, irascibility and inirascibility as excess and deficiency, respectively. In the area of truth-telling, you have truthfulness, which is the virtue, boastfulness, which is the excess, and self-deprecation which is the deficiency. Evidently, truthfulness here is concerned telling the truth about oneself, self-referential truthfulness, as opposed to honesty in general. Amusements, you have the virtue of wittiness, the excess of buffoonery and the deficiency of boorishness. In sociability, you have having the sense of shame in society. Excess would be being overly prone to shame, and deficiency would be being shameless. In the area of moral feeling, you have proper indignation as a virtue, envy as excess, and spite as deficiency. And Aristotle clearly intends this uh, list to be exhaustive. Um, However, he never clearly explains the principle of selection behind this list. Why just these virtues and no others? And this leads to one of the thorniest questions of the Nicomachean ethics. And this will be our third discussion question with which we will close, which is, is there a principle of selection that underlies Aristotle's list of the virtues of character? If there is, what is it? Is this principle justified? If not, or if there isn't any principle that you can discern, how do you think Aristotle came up with this list? Are there any important virtues of character that Aristotle leaves off his list? Explain what these are and why you would include them.